Amen. Well, it's good to be back on the radio again today. We certainly do appreciate the good Lord allowing us to be able to come to you by means of radio. This is the Bear Trail Baptist Church broadcast, and we certainly are privileged to be the pastor there, Brother Tim Kratz. And it's always a great blessing. The Lord allows us to be able to, to bring you the radio broadcast each week, and we thank you so much for those of you that we hear from on a weekly basis as well. If you'd like more information concerning our church, you can visit our church website, BearTrailBaptistChurch.com. The website does have information regarding our service times, the location of our church, and we'd be glad to have you come visit with us anytime that you possibly can. Maybe if you live in the area and don't have a home church, uh, the Lord has tremendously blessed us a great deal with visitors lately. We've been having visitors for almost every service, and we certainly do thank the Lord for that. Many first-time visitors as well. And uh, so we hope the Lord will continue to help us be a blessing to folks uh, locally. Maybe you're traveling on vacation and are looking for a church to attend while you're traveling around. Look us up if, on the internet, if you will. If we're, uh, maybe we're located in, uh, in your traveling path. We'd be glad to have you drop in with us and be in a service or two with us. We have that to happen from time to time as well. Well, we're going to start a brand new psalm today, Psalm number 32, uh, which is a penitent psalm. Uh, it's unique uh, because it's one of seven penitent psalms in the Bible. Psalm 6, Psalm 32, Psalm 50, uh, 38, Psalm 51, uh, Psalm 102, Psalm 130, and Psalm 143 are labeled as penitent psalms in the Bible. Uh, it is also the first of 13 psalms that contain the word, I hope I say this correctly, masculine in the heading or in the title. Uh, it's a psalm of David, masculine, it says, uh, in the heading. And it's also one of 13 psalms that contain beatitudes. And so we'll pray together. We'll get right into the psalm as far as the introduction part of it uh, anyway, and see what we can, uh, how far we can get today uh, in this wonderful psalm. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We ask you help us today to be a blessing to you, to be a blessing to the congregation, Lord, that's hearing. And Father, for all that you do, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. The psalm says, or the heading for the psalms is a psalm of David, masculine. Uh, the word masculine in the title, meaning to look at, means to behold. It means to view and then to act prudently or circumspectly. It means making wise or prudent or conveying instruction, if you will. Uh, as the title that's given to this psalm, as well as to several other psalms, I think I mentioned there are 13 psalms that contain this word in the heading. And uh, it's conveying the idea that the psalm was adapted to make one wise or to impart instruction. Now, the psalm is composed of the following parts. While we are reading, there's 11 verses in the psalm. While we're reading the psalm, we'll just make a comment uh, as we go along. First of all, a statement of the blessings of forgiveness is the leading thought of the psalm. The psalm says in verse number one, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. Second of all, there is a description of the state of mind when one is under conviction of sin. The Bible says in verse number three, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer, Selah. The third thing we see is the effect of confession of sin, uh, resulting in a sense of forgiveness and peace. Verse number five, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. The fourth thing that we see is an encouragement to others in the fact that the psalmist has found peace and he has found pardon when he called upon the name of the Lord and asked for forgiveness. The Bible says in verse number six, for this show everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters, they shall not come nigh unto thee. Fifth of all, there is an expression of confidence in God as a refuge and a hiding place in the time of trouble. 
I don't know about you, my friend, but I certainly am thankful that we have somewhere to run and we have someone that we can have confidence on to hide us in our time of trouble. The Bible says in verse number eight, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way. I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong verse. Verse number seven, thou art my hiding place and thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance, Selah. The sixth thing we see, the psalmist undertakes to uh, instruct them and guide them lest they behave like animals. And he said, I will instruct thee, verse eight, and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. And then he says, be not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. And then finally, the seventh thing that we see as the, the psalm is composed of all these different parts we see the blessedness of trusting in the Lord. And uh, we'll read these last two verses here in just a moment. You'll see that we are compassed with mercy. We are glad in the Lord and we are shouting for joy because of the forgiveness of sin. Verse 32 or chapter 32, verse 10, the Bible says, many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Now, the Bible says in verse number one, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now, this very first word in the psalm, blessed, it is equivalent to happy. Uh, happy is the man, or happy is the condition, the state of mind. Happy are the prospects of one whose sins are forgiving. His condition is happy or blessed. Now, this is the second time that a psalm, that a psalm has began with the word blessed. If you remember the very first psalm, Psalm 1, began with the word blessed. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Here, Psalm 32 is the next psalm that begins with the word blessed. And uh, uh, the one in Psalm 1 is used to describe a man who walks in God's way. He walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, so he is blessed. Here in Psalm 32, the word blessed is used to describe a person who has not walked in God's way, but, 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 thank God for that, but has been forgiven after he repented, and now he is able to enjoy the Lord, and uh, he is able to enjoy the goodness of the Lord and the blessings of the Lord. Listen, God does not want us to be miserable. God doesn't want you to be miserable. He really wants us to be blessed. He really wants us to be happy or joyful, and if we have our sins forgiven, we have reason to be joyful. Now, so this is a what is known as a beatitude. And uh, there are other Psalms, 17 times in the Psalms, maybe, maybe more, but at least 17 times in the Psalms, it talks about being blessed. I mentioned Psalm 1 already. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Psalm 2, verse number 12, the Bible says, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Look, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Psalm 34, verse number 8 says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Psalm 84, verse number 12, the Bible says, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. So it's obvious that there is blessedness, there is happiness. You can be joyful if your trust is in the Lord. Friend, if your trust is in yourself, or if your trust is in the government, or if your trust is in a religion, or if your trust is in another person, they're going to fail you. But I'm glad we can safely trust in the Lord and we can be blessed by doing so. Now, here in our psalm, Psalm 32, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, 
and in whose spirit there is no guile. Praise God for that. Psalm 33, verse 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people who he hath chosen for his own inheritance. I'll tell you one reason that the blessings of God seems to be decreasing upon our nation, upon our land is because uh, the, the God is no longer, if he ever was, God is certainly no longer the God of this nation. In fact, the majority of this nation doesn't want anything to do with God. They don't want no part. Now I'm talking about the true God. Everybody has a God. I'm talking about the true and living God, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's very few who are interested in worshiping and serving the true and living God. But the Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 40, in verse number four, blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust. There's another one of those trust Psalms uh, with being blessed and respecteth not the proud nor such as turn aside the lies. Psalm 41 in verse number one says, blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in the time of trouble. Psalm 84 verse number four, the Bible says, blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will still, will be still praising thee, Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them. Psalm 89, verse 15, blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. Psalm 94, verse number 12, blessed is the man whom thou chasteneth, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. None of us like chastisement. None of us enjoy being chastened, but the Bible says that we are blessed when we are chastened of the Lord. You know why? It is one sure fact that we belong to him. And uh, I'm, I'm, believe me, have been chastened way too many times. I, I'm thankful. I am blessed to be chastened of the Lord. I, I want to live right. I want to do right. I want to be pleasing to the Lord. And uh, so uh, I have certainly had some chastisement from the Lord. Psalm 112 in verse number one says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. There is joy, there is happiness in fearing the Lord. Psalm 119 verse number one, the Bible says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and they and that seek him with the whole heart. Psalm 128 in verse number one, the Bible says, blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord that walketh in his way. So this Psalm is a pinnacle Psalm. It is a Psalm of repentance. This Psalm is a messianic Psalm, or this Psalm contains the word masco in the title, one of 13 Psalms. And this Psalm is also a Psalm of Beatitudes, one of 17 times we see that in the book of Psalms. Now, so come back to verses one and two, Psalm 32, we see the blessing of forgiveness. The Bible says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. Now it has been said, it has been said that sin is so offensive to God that he uses 15 different words for sin in the Old Testament. Now, I don't know if you noticed or not, but here in these first two verses that we read in Psalm 32, four words are used for sin. Now, these four words are transgression, sin, iniquity, and guile. So let's take a quick look at these four words and see what their meaning is, what their definition is in Scripture. So first of all, transgression. Now, a transgression is sin's defiance. The definition of a transgression is going away, a going away or departure. It is a rebellion against God's authority. It's an act of revolt, if you will. It's crossing over a line or going out of bounds. I, I guess an easy example of that would be if you were playing some kind of well-known sport in our day, you were playing basketball, there's an out-of-bounds line. If you were playing football, you can go out-of-bounds on either side or at the back of the end zone. 
Uh, if you're playing baseball, there is a foul line, which basically means it is out of out of bounds. There's a foul ball. It's out of bounds. And so uh, it has to do with going out of bounds. The transgression is going away or departing. It is rebellion against God's authority. It is crossing a line or going out of bounds. Now, we are wrong. We're in the wrong when we rebel against God. His boundaries between right and wrong is laid out in Scripture. And when we step over those boundaries, we are transgressing against the Word of God, and we're transgressing against our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so a transgression is an outward aspect of our sin against God. It is a sin that is committed in the body. Let me explain. The Bible says, speaking of our Savior in Isaiah chapter 53, a prophetic passage concerning the, uh, the, the uh, brutal beating and crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse number five, but he was wounded for our transgressions. So this is outward. It is outward wounds, wounds in his body. Isaiah 53, verse number eight says, for the transgression of the people was he stricken. Now, stricken means to be struck or smitten, if you will. It is an outward affliction. And so our Lord was wounded and stricken in his body for the sins of our flesh, the outward sins of our flesh. Now, so transgression is sin's defiance. Sin in itself is sin's defect. Now, the literal definition for sin is falling short of the mark. When we fail to do what God commands us to do, we are wrong. In fact, anything that is contrary to God's word is sin. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, if we have any understanding of all what the Bible teaches about sin, we'll have no problem understanding that we are all sinners and we are all in need of a great Savior. And I'm glad we have one, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Now, if sin in our life is slowly killing off parts of our life, then we should be deeply concerned about what sin is, amen. It could be that because of sin in our lives, a, a little bit of our fellowship dies each day, or, or maybe a little bit of our peace dies each day, or maybe a little bit of our happiness dies each day, or, or maybe a little bit of our marriage dies, or our relationship dies, or, or maybe relations with our family and friends, maybe a little bit of that dies each day, because the wages of sin is death. Now, if the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, sin is killing us, amen. And so what is sin? Well, the Bible says in, in Proverbs 21 and verse number four, the Bible says in high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. Now, if we were ever able to do anything right, if we were able to do anything right, if we, if we were able to be, obey all the law and follow the word of God to the letter, which we cannot do, but if we did, if we were able to do that and we did it with pride because we were able to accomplish something that no one else could do, then we would be guilty of sin because of pride in our heart. So a high look and a proud heart and the plow of the wicked is sin. The Bible says in Proverbs 24 and verse number nine, the thought of foolishness is sin. Now, if there wasn't any other definition of sin listed in the Bible, the majority of us would be guilty because of this one. Now, even if we didn't have thoughts of foolishness, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that almost all of us at some time or another have thoughts of foolishness, and the Bible says if we do that, that it is sin, but even if you are one of those few, and I would think there would be a very few individuals who do not have thoughts of foolishness, we certainly do not keep our thoughts and our mind upon the Lord and the things of the Lord every hour of every single day either. And so the thought of foolishness is sin. The Bible says in Romans 14, 23, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith. Now listen to this. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. 
So anything that we do that we do not put faith in God is sin. Now, I'm not saying that this is possible for us to do. I'm just trying. I, I'm trying, and the Bible is trying to get us to understand that we are sinners. And because of the fact that we are sinners, we must trust God for his forgiveness of our sin. Amen. The Bible says in 1 John 3 and verse number 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So every time that we go beyond a limit of the law of God, we sin. Now, if we only, if we just took the time to look at the Ten Commandments uh, in the Bible, we are all doomed apart from the forgiveness of God. Amen. So I am thankful. Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven. Amen. Now, so the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 17, all unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not unto death. So anything that we do that is unrighteous is sin. Now listen, it doesn't say that anything that we do that is not right is sin. It says all unrighteousness is sin. And so anything that we do that is not right in the eyes of God is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. Now the Bible also says in James chapter 4, and verse number 17, the Bible says, Therefore the him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And so there are sins of commission and there are sins of omission. And so anything that we know we are supposed to do and we are not doing, it is sin. Now, I'll just list a couple off the top of my head. The Bible says that we're to pray without ceasing. The Bible says that we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature the Bible says, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together as the matter of some is. The Bible says to rejoice evermore. The Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself. And so uh, how am I doing so far, amen? Why in the world would we get upset about when someone calls us a sinner, amen? The Bible makes it very clear that we are a sinner and we should be rejoicing in the fact that Jesus Christ has forgiven us of our sin. And so the Bible says, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now listen, sin is the root of all of our trouble. It is the very heart and soul aspect of all of our problems. The Bible says in Isaiah 53 and verse number 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief and thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. And so we talked about transgression and a transgression is sin's defiance. We talked about sin, and that in itself is sin's defect. Now we talk about iniquity. Iniquity is sin's distortion. Now iniquity means depraved. It means corrupt. It means warped or crooked. Iniquity describes the inner character of a person. Iniquity has to do with our attitude. It has to do with our spirit. It has to do with our motivation towards sin. Now, why do we do the things that we do that are right? In other words, what, what is our motivation or our attitude for doing what is right? Let me give you something. Why, why do we attend church? Why do we witness to our lost friends and family members and strangers that we come into contact with? Why do we pass out tracts? Why, why do we try to talk right? Why do we try to dress right? Listen, if we do these things and many, many more that we could make mention of, and we do them with the wrong attitude or with the wrong motivation, it is iniquity. Now, why, why do we do the things that are wrong? What, what is our attitude or our motivation for doing things that are not right, for doing things that are wrong? It's because, is it because we don't know any better or is it because we are willingly committing iniquity? Now, our flesh is bent. Our flesh is warped. Our flesh is crooked, amen. And so iniquity is an inward aspect of our sin against God. The Bible says this in Isaiah 53 and verse number five, speaking of Christ again, it says, for he was bruised for our iniquities. Now, a bruise is an inward wound that is caused by an outward 
action. It is also a wound that is internal, but it manifests itself externally. Now, our iniquity, our spirit, our attitude, and our motivation is often seen by others, even though it is an inward aspect of our sin against God. And so uh, it, we are affected inwardly, and it is expressed outwardly, and others see it. So Christ was bruised for our iniquities. Now, guile is sin's deception. So I want to mention these again, and we'll try to get this one in before we run out of time. Transgression is sin's defiance. Sin is sin's defect. Iniquity is sin's distortion. And guile is sin's deception. Now, guile means insecurity. It means cunning. It means duplicity. It means slothfulness or deception. And friend, you know that Satan is the master of deception. He is the father of lies. We are often deceived by our own sinfulness. Many times we tend to justify and explain away our sin or our action. This, this sin is deception or guile, if you will. When we do this, we reap the consequences of those sins because we fail to seek forgiveness of those sins. Now, we, it is certainly possible for you and I to be our own worst enemy. Now, in fact, God's word warns us not to deceive ourselves. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 18, it says, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Jesus, preacher, what in the world does that mean? It's talking about being deceived and it's talking about the wisdom of the world, let him become a fool that he might be wise. Let me just give you a few examples. The world says that it's crazy for you to read your Bible and to study your Bible. Don't be deceived by the foolishness of the world. You better be reading and studying your Bible. The Bible says that you're crazy if you're faithful to attend a local church. Don't be deceived by the world into believing that lie. It is very pleasing to God for you to be faithful to a local Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. Hey, the Bible says, or the world says that you're crazy for standing up for, for Jesus in public. Don't be deceived by the foolishness of this world. Don't allow the world to deceive you. Do not deceive yourself into thinking that it's foolish to stand up for God in public. That's exactly what the Lord desires for us to do. Listen, the world says that you're crazy for giving your money to support a local church or to support missionaries. Don't be deceived by believing the world. Become a fool to worldly wisdom that you may be wise in Christ. Listen, if you're not actively pursuing the things of God and you are a believer, you have deceived yourself. Don't be self-deceived, friend. You should follow after the things of God. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth of it is. So the, the other edge of that double-edged sword, amen, is for those super religious who think they have never done any wrong since they got saved and believe that they have no sin since they got saved. I want to tell you something, friend. The Bible says you have deceived yourself. So our text says, blessed is the man in whose spirit there is no guile. Now listen, this is not speaking of a sinless person. It is a person who is not trying to cover or hide his sin. In other words, it is a person who has agreed with God that I am a guilty sinner and I am acknowledging to God that I am a sinner and that I am in great need of your forgiveness. That's exactly what David is doing in this penitent psalm. That's what he's doing here. And so we, like David, David did for a year or more. He refused to repent and acknowledge his sin, and in doing so, he is full of guile. So listen, if you are refusing to repent and to acknowledge your sin to God, you are self-deceived. The Bible says you are full of guile. Friend, don't be trying to deceive God. That's an impossibility. Our time is quickly coming going again today. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Barrett Trail Baptist Church broadcast. May God bless you till we meet again is our prayer. Thank you so much for watching on social media. Please like and share the broadcast so we can reach more people. God bless you and thank you. Good day.